Hello and welcome to the Alexandra Wenman Show. I am so delighted to be joined by my guest this morning. He is a best-selling author and inspired leadership guide, Mr. Nick Williams. Gosh, you know a lot about inspired leadership. You've been in the business for so long. You've, you've led thousands of events all over the world. You've worked with some of the world's best spiritual teachers. And I believe, because you came into my life at a time where you really helped me when I was going through a big transition, which was many moons ago. But what do you think, Nick, it takes to make an inspired leader? <laughs> Straight in. A, co a combination of inspiration and madness, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of courage, I think. You know, I think a lot of us are here to, you know, in, in whatever way, help shift this world from fear to love. You know, I think that that's the big kind of job description for all of us at the moment, you know, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, but I, I don't know about you, but certainly I, I, I grew up with a lot of fear. You know, I grew up with a lot of the old paradigm, if you like, the old conditioning. So I do think it takes a lot of courage to really show up and be authentically ourselves. You know, I think most of us have been so trained to, to play roles and to not be who we really are. So you know it's that paradox of like it takes a lot of courage to be yourself but then when you are you go well, what was the big deal you know why was <laughs> yeah. but it takes a lot of growth to get there if you like yeah what were some of the biggest challenges you found on the way to kind of stepping into your own leadership role um well the two things that really come to mind you know partly loneliness you know partly kind of going am i the only one thinking like this am i mad but I, I feel less like that today. I think no, there's, you know, there's a real big shift in consciousness that we're all part of. So, a, I feel more connected now. Um, but I think, you know, for me, as probably like most people watching this, I've had a pretty fierce inner critic. You know, that every time I get inspired and think about doing something, it goes, "Who the hell are you to be doing this?" You know, you're a computer salesman from Essex. You know, right? <laughs> get back in your box. You know, you're nobody special. So, that's been my you know, my kind of, uh, my own nemesis, you know, in my own head is my own inner critic. Really. Shall we go back? Let, shall we just fill our, our viewers in a little bit uh, about your journey to how mm. you got here? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about where it all started for you? Yeah, I suppose I'd call the first half of my life fairly normal, you know, which was, you know, I did O levels and A levels and a degree in business studies and marketing. And then I went into corporate sales and marketing for about eight or nine years. Um, and I was reasonably good at it. And I think that's in a way... I was, it was, I was thinking that's why you're so good at it. You, you've done it all. <laughs> well, I think at the heart of it, there was two things I always enjoyed about it. A, communicating. I always loved communicating, even when I was in a sales kind of environment. But also being of service. You know, I, I, you know in a way, I love serving people rather than selling them stuff. And when I could serve them with stuff that also made me money and made the company money, it was, it was a good deal. So, so I did that. But then, you know, like a lot of people, I kind of went, is this really why I'm on earth? You know, was I really born to sell computers to Japanese banks? Was that, you know, if I'm still doing this at 65, am I going to say that that's a life well lived? And the answer was a resounding no. You know, this isn't why you're on earth. And I know a lot of people feel like that, but in a way they try and squash that inner voice. You know, I would call that the voice of our soul, the voice of our calling. And I think most of us do a pretty good job of trying to not listen to that inner voice because it's scary. It's like, you know, it often invites us to make significant change. So, you know, I, 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 even when I was selling computers, I gave my first talk in 1986, so over 30 years ago now. And I just had a very different experience of myself while I gave that talk. It was only two hours, but I went, this is what I'm on earth to do. I'm here to teach, to inspire, to you know, to have fun as well and, you know, to be inspired and to be inspiring. Um, and that was 33 years ago. So it took me three or four years to kind of pluck up the courage to then leave my corporate career to start my own business. So I started my own business uh, in 1990, so nearly 30 years ago. And it was a slow start, to be honest, you know, but I just hung in there and bit by bit, I found my voice, I found my confidence, I built an audience um, and I'm still doing that and I'm loving it, you know, and in business terms today, I think I, I, I've got what most people would call a global micro brand, which means, yes, you know, I, I, I've touched a lot of people across the planet, but it, in a narrow niche. I don't think any of us today are mass market. So, you know, for me, I think one of the, the key things is about resonance. You know, we find the people that we're here to serve and they resonate with us and I, we resonate with them. So to me, the act of kind of showing up and, and letting ourselves be seen and known is to, is to find that resonance and people to resonate with us. 
It's so lovely. I think one of the, the nicest things about you, Nick, is how you, you're able to kind of bring the, the essence of a person to the forefront. You know, it's not, it's not first and foremost about the brand, it's about the person and how yeah. that person's kind of humanity fits into that brand, if you will. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, a few years ago, I did think a lot about this whole idea of branding. And, you know, obviously so much branding is a commercial invention. It's, it's smoke and mirrors, you know, it's like, well, we'll create this brand because it might sell lots of stuff. So I nearly rejected the whole idea of branding, but then I got to think about it and I thought, well, actually, you know, if you know who you really are and you know what you're really about and you know that and communicate it clearly and powerfully to the people that you can serve, that's a great way of using branding. Mm. So, you know, it's the same ideas in a way, but with a different purpose. You know, instead of a brand just having a commercial purpose, a brand can have a, a spiritual purpose, a creative purpose, a, you know, a higher purpose. I totally agree. I have a friend, Sally, and she talks, she's a, a branding expert as well, and she talks a lot about our humanness mm. and how important that is. For yeah. me, I think it's, it really is about our, our, our essence, the true essence of who we are and, and what we're here to do as part of our purpose. And it's so funny because we're in this time on the planet, aren't we, where you know, we're, we're, we're kind of doing this meaningful, well, lo lots of us in the spiritual path, obviously, mm. it's meaningful work, but many people are uncomfortable about bringing it into a business forum. Mm. What advice would you give to people who are working as sort of healers and teachers who are trying to, I guess, make a go of it in the business world? Right. You know, it's a great question. And it's something, you know, if I'm honest, I've struggled with a lot over the years. And no, I, th I think for so many of us, the kind of spiritual world and the commercial world don't meet very, very often in a way. It's like, you know, we, we have our business world and then we do our spirituality on the evenings and weekends, you know, that, that kind of thing. But I, I've always wanted to unify them. I've always wanted to bring them together. But, you know, I'd spent time in the commercial world then I spent time in the spiritual world. But I guess for the last 10, 15 years, for me, it's about being really trying to bring those together. And a, a breakthrough kind of thing for me was about finding language as well, as well as that kind of inner integration. But how could I use language that didn't switch people off? So I did, in, in the end, I came up with this idea of inspiration, really. You know, it's like when I talk about inspiration in, a, in the spiritual world, people go, oh, yeah. And when I talk about inspiration in the commercial world and the leadership world, people go, oh, yeah. Yeah. It so for me, it's, it's a unifier. Yeah. You know, and I, can I tell you a very quick story about how, Absolutely. You know, like a pivotal moment. You know, I, I had a pivotal moment. I think it was in about 2003. But I, th I thought I was on candid camera for a minute because I, I got this call from somebody and they said, I'm the head of, I don't know, learning and development, I think it was, for uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Zurich. Um, would you be interested in coming and giving a talk for us on inspiration in the workplace? And part of me was going, you know, the <laughs> words auditors, inspiration and Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> I never expected to hear in the same sentence. A part of me went, you know, am I on candid camera? Is this a joke? <laughs> you know? So I asked, you know, I tried not to kind of, um, you know, I just asked a couple of questions. I said, well, can you tell me the business case for this? Why would you want me to do this? What, what's your thinking? And he shared, he said, look, you know, the, the guys we want you to come and talk to and the women, you know, the men and women are in their late twenties. They're just about to move from being auditors to managers and leaders, leaders of younger auditors. And we know the younger auditors want to work for somebody that inspires them. And we know that if these people don't offer some inspiration, we're probably going to use the, lose the younger people. And I went, whoa, you know, you've really thought this through. You know, that this is, there is a business case for inspiration. And I've done a lot of research, you know, and even things like the Sunday Times top 100 companies to work for a while ago, they, their whole section was, if you want to be a top company, you've got to be an inspiring place to work. So increasingly, I think there is a business case for inspiration as well as, you know, it's good and it's nice and it's, it's good for our spiritual and emotional well-being. It is also good business. That's it. I mean, you've got what you've got happening on the planet now is all these young people coming through, all these millennials who are, they don't want to go out and drink and party. That Half of them are doing their own startups. They're very entrepreneurial. Yeah, they want to do something meaningful. Yeah, they, they don't need do a boss. <laughs> Sorry? They don't, most of them don't need a boss, so it's like to entice them into a bigger a yeah. big business or a corporate environment. It's yeah. like they need something yeah. to hold them. Yeah, so so for me, that's how I've, I've brought those two things together. So, you know, 
really that's what I speak about and that's why my latest book is called you know be inspired be inspiring be yourself I think it's hard to be inspiring if you're not being yourself <laughs> this is very true so how what's your advice on sort of finding your inner leader I think a lot of us you know are leaders in many ways I think we're moving into this new paradigm of having to be our own leader our own guru our own teacher I think that's really important but how can people find that that sort of inner leader within themselves um, well, again, through I, I think through a sense of inspiration. You know, I, I think when we're inspired about something, it's our soul speaking to us. So, so that would be one thing. Also, you know, I, I think the whole world, or the whole word leadership and leading comes with a lot of baggage. You know, for most of us, leadership means having a position, being anointed, appointed, voted for. And if you put yourself into a position of leadership, you're probably going to get a lot of crap coming your way. You know, people are going to judge you and criticize you and try and put you down and defeat you. So for many of us, it's just not an attractive idea even to think about being in leadership. So I think, you know, I've had to clear a lot of my own baggage about what does it even mean? So I, I've kind of shifted my thinking. It's a very subtle distinction, but I think it's quite powerful. So instead of being a leader, I, I think increasingly about offering leadership. Mm. That's a good way. Really, each yeah. of us can offer leadership in any moment. Like in a way, this is a leadership conversation. You've shown up. I've shown up. This is a leadership conversation, you know, but, you know, I don't know what you're doing afterwards, but I might, you know, <laughs> afterwards I might go into a, a bunch of self attack and say, oh, I said all the wrong things. So, no, you know, Nick. or whatever. <laughs> but, but, but in this moment, I'm in my flow. I'm offering leadership. Absolutely. And I think that I think that people, you know, we think of leadership, we put so much um, almost pressure on ourselves around yeah. that word. You think that being a leader means you have to be a boss or you have to be in charge of something. But yeah. you're being a leader, if you're just having a chat with a friend and offering helpful advice in the moment, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. You're stepping yeah. into that role. So yeah. I wonder if there's a, a, a word that would not be quite as, um, I don't know, daunting for people, but yeah. I... I still like the power of leadership, you know, the word leadership. It, it's yeah. got power to it. Well, I, I, you know, like most of the things, you know, I, I started off talking about work and then kind of business and entrepreneurship, now much more in the leadership area. I think I've just resigned myself to the fact that we, we need to clear the baggage around these words and give them a different purpose. You know, for most people, work was something you do for money. It's not something you do for spiritual expression or business. It's something you do to make money. Same with leadership. You know, mostly leadership is about trying to control people. Mm. And I love the idea that the best leadership is about liberating people. Yeah. You know, so, so, uh, so another bit that's helped me kind of reframe leadership is that leadership is a choice, not a position. Mm. And, you know, I think the first time I heard that, it was so powerful for me to think, oh, nobody needs to give me a position of leadership. I can choose. And, and in my work now, you know, I love working with people that simply choose to offer leadership who don't have a position. You know, I'll just tell you the, the story of one of, she's in the book, but, you know, one of my clients that most inspires me. You know, she's an Indian woman, you know, she's brought up in the UK, I think, but now lives in India. And, and basically she started a school, you know, based on, you know, kind of empowering young people to be the best that they can be. And this school has become really successful. And, you know, people are now moving from different parts of India to near to, to send their children to this school because it's so inspiring. But when I asked her, I said, well, why did you set this up? And I hadn't realized it until she told me. She said, you know, I've got a, I had a young daughter. I didn't want to send her to any of the schools. So she created one herself. She created a amazing. school that she would be happy to send her daughter to. And I just thought, to me, that's leadership. It's like the call in her was so strong to say, you know, I want to do something beautiful for my daughter, but I also want to do something beautiful for the world. That and that, amazing. to me, is like that, that one story. You know, she's such an inspiring woman. You know, I've coached her, and you know, I may even end up going to India to do a book launch event at some point. You know, I just think she's amazing. You know, and I love working with people that inspire me. So who does inspire you? Who, who are your most inspiring um, you know, there are, there are some kind of public people, you know, like uh, probably about five, six years ago, maybe longer, I, I was very blessed to go to an evening in London with uh, Desmond Tutu, you know, Ooh, wow. Desmond Tutu. Yeah. and to me, he was one of the most inspiring kind of leaders that I'd ever come across, you know, he just seemed so open, so funny, you know, he was talking about, talking about forgiveness, I suppose I was just kind of thinking, well, 
you know, he had every reason under the sun to be bitter and angry and vengeful. And he wasn't. And, and why? Because he practiced forgiveness. So, you know, I don't think we often talk about forgiveness in the context of leadership, but I also think, you know, part of great leadership is about learning to forgive ourselves for all our judgments and all the people that kind of have a go at us. That's not to condone what they do, but to say there's a place beyond judgment. You know. That's As, really powerful, actually. When um, around the time you and I met, I've spoken about it before, but when um, the magazine I was working for collapsed, mm, um, yeah, was that was a big shock. Really bad cyberbullying, and like was blamed for the demise of the magazine. And I remember at the time, just going into such a a, a dialogue with myself about mm. was it my fault? Did I do something? You know, yeah. why am I accountable for it? And I and I wasn't. What I discovered though was that I had almost place too much importance on my role and not enough importance on me mm. you know, it was like all my all my sort of um what, what's the word importance came from the title mm. and and not from what i had to bring to the role and i think that was the universe giving me a big kick up the bum and going actually no let's see yeah. how you how you deal with life if you don't have a title right go back to basics and and yeah. do and, and that's a lot of the coaching that i've done it was a lot of my difficulty in transition you know i worked for a big multinational company that gave me a lot of sense of identity and you know i i, I struggled with it like you did and i i've worked with a lot of people who go well who am i without my position if i'm not working for a brand and how could I ever be significant myself? Yeah. And I think that's often the growth is to, 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 to understand more fully our own significance, if you like. Uh, but if I may just share one other story about somebody who's really inspired and influenced me over the last few years. Um, it's a long story, but the brief version of it is I coached a woman who was a TV producer about 11 years ago, and she was in a kind of career doldrums and not quite sure even if she was ever going to produce TV again. But cut, then I lost contact with her, but to cut a long story short, uh, I reconnected with her about six years ago, and she's turned out to be the executive producer of Downton Abbey now. So oh, amazing. Her, her career, career doldrums was, you know, just before a big leap forward in her own you know, life and career. So we reconnected and we became, well, we've become mates, and we've had lots of conversations. I created a product out of one of our conversations. But what I hadn't really understood and, and what so inspired me is she says, you know, my job as a producer is to enable the best performances of everybody on set. You know, whether they're in front of the camera or behind the camera, my job is to help them shine, to create a workplace where they feel safe, where they can show up and give their best. And then I get to look good because they do their best. And I just thought that's the kind of leader that I want to see more of in the world who has the confidence to say, how can I help you do your best work rather than how can I keep you in your place? That's the kind of leaders we need running the countries. That, that's like the micro. That's why I wrote this book. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> to, to, to start that, you know, to, just to contribute to that conversation. You know, I'm, mm. I don't think I'm, you know, I'm not grandiose in thinking I'm going to change the whole world, but it's like, let's have more of these conversations. I agree. I think, you know, the more that we kind of help others to, to shine and to be the best that they can be, the, more, the, more, the better we feel, right? If, yeah. you, if you help somebody get to where they need to be, there's no better feeling. I think we just need more of that. This old paradigm of competition and yeah, sure. you can't have success or I can't have success if you've got it. it it's just, it's so outdated now. Yeah. Well, I presume that's what you love doing as a healer is helping people clear their stuff so they can shine. That's what I love doing as a coach. Yeah, yeah. nothing more shine. fulfilling. No, so tell us about the book, Nick. What, what can people hope to discover in those, those golden pages? <laughs> um, but it's the first significant book I've written it's my 16th book but it's probably the first significant one I've written for about seven years I've written lots of little ones but I feel like I've been through a kind of you know a whole transition probably since I, I kind of last saw you and I've had to shed a load of stuff so basically the messages of the book are very much what we're talking about which is you know how how can well let's go back for a second I think we're all much more capable of, in, of offering leadership than we think we are not necessarily leading a company or, you know, being a politician or whatever, but we can offer leadership in our little corner of the world, whatever that is, whether that's, as you say, in our family, with our friends, whether it's in our community, or whether we have a business where we're offering kind of inspiration and leadership and hope to people. So, uh, so number one, you know, one message is about we, we can all offer leadership. 
And I always liked the idea, you know, the first time I heard it, my heart sank low. But, you know, that idea of like, we are the hope for humanity. Yeah. You know, the first time I heard that idea, I thought, well, then we're screwed in that case. If I'm the hope for humanity, <laughs> there is no hope. Because, you know, I, I, I just didn't think I could really lead, you know. So, you know, I think I've personally now got to a place where I feel a lot more confident in, in the leadership that I'm offering and the kind of people that I work with. And because I've spent a lot more time around people that lead their own companies and lead their own projects, you know, I've, in a way I've kind of, it's been humbling, you know, to realize that so many people that are offering leadership are often struggling. You know, we, it's, I think what a, one of the conclusions, you know, one of the things I write about in the last chapter is, you know, leadership is so easy to criticize and it's much, much harder to, to embody. To actually step into it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that's not to say there are crap, there aren't crap leaders who are doing a bad job. Yes, there are. You know, I think there are narcissistic ego trip leaders, sure. Um, but there's a lot of people trying to do a lot of good and they're struggling. You know, so, you know, I don't know if you ever read a book by Michael Gerber called The E-Myth. Did you know? Mm. know but one of the big things was he talked about the difference between working in your business and on your business. And, mm. and, you know, I use that idea a lot with entrepreneurs over the years. You know, most entrepreneurs are so busy doing what they do, they don't step back to think about what they're doing and they're growing themselves and evolving themselves. And I think that's equally true for leadership. You know, I had a conversation with somebody last week who was a coach, but she offers leadership coaching in some corporates, you know, doing a brilliant job. And her big thing is about helping them move from fear to love in what they're doing. But she's so busy doing it, she doesn't get a chance to look at her own leadership. You know, so she's going to hire me to, to help her get clearer on her messages and what's the next chapter for her in her leadership. And, and I think, you know, I think it's so important that we all step back and have an opportunity to reflect and to go, OK, you know, stop being so busy doing what I do. Let me reflect on myself. What are my strengths? What what's my soul calling me to do and be next? You know, most of us don't get to ask those questions because we're so busy doing stuff or firefighting. It's so important, isn't it? And in terms of your one-on-one -on -one work with people, like if, if someone was going to work with you, what could they expect? How do you, how do you work with everyone? Is it different? For um, well, it's very much tailored, but, you know, it's interesting because I've written this book, but, you know, already I'm kind of halfway through several more books. But, and one of them is going to be about thought leadership. Because a lot of the leaders today that I admire, they, they do have, often have a position, if you like, or a platform. But to, to a large extent, they're offering thought leadership. They're saying there is another way of thinking about this. There is another way of doing this. So, you know, what, exactly what you were saying earlier, one of the things I love doing is helping people get to the essence of them. Because most of us are so mired in our own programming and conditioning and what we think we should do and ought to do that I love helping hold a mirror up to people and going, you know, did you hear what you just said? And they go, did really, did I just say that? You know, and I'm, I'm so aware that often we don't even realize what we're saying. We need somebody to, so, to say to us, do you realize what you just said, how powerful that was? And they went, I suppose it is really, but I'm so used to saying it, I don't realize how powerful it is or how significant it is. So I love doing that kind of thing because... Um, at the, at the heart of it, I, lo I love helping people blossom. You know, that, that's probably exactly what you do. I love enabling people to blossom into not who they could be, but who they already are in essence. My belief is that, you know, the best leaders are like gardeners, really. They just create the conditions that people can blossom in. So, you know, for me being a coach or a speaker or a writer, in a way, it's all me being a gardener saying, you know, here's some ideas to help you blossom. Um, so I love working with people one to one. I love giving talks. You know, I love writing. Any 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 opportunity to get the ideas out. And as you say, you know, sometimes just one idea can change somebody's life. It's absolutely true. It's amazing. You know, you're, you're you're probably so immersed in inspiration a lot of the time, like I am. We tend to forget that most people aren't immersed in it. This is true. I think yeah. I think I kind of because we eat, sleep, and breathe it. You're just doing what you do most yeah. of the time, aren't yeah. you? And then when you okay. step back and go, oh, okay, yeah, no. But I find as well when you're when you're living from that essence, and when you're mm. when you are um, just in that inspiration all the time, and you're seeing the beauty of the world and the people around you, it helps you to recognise the leadership in other people too. I, I just come yeah. back from India. And because I channel and I'm very clear audience and my guides are around me a lot of the time and I often get messages about where I'm going and what I need to do. And I kept getting this message, you will meet the holy man on the road. 
And I was like, well, it's India. Surely I'm going to see plenty of holy men. Like there's a little skeptic. Can't even go and buy a cup of tea without bumping into a holy person. But it was like, be sure you recognize him. And I was walking around. I had all this death rebirth symbolism going on. And I was speaking to the jungle and the mountain. I was having, everything was all interconnected. And I was just feeling this, almost this paradise of the world around me. I really felt like I'd stepped back into this sort of heaven on earth vision that I had as a child. Mm. And so I'm looking for this holy man and I'm kind of expecting him to be wearing white. And there was this thing about you're going to receive a gift from him. And I got to the final week. I've been traveling for a month. And the final week, my friend Lalama, who lives in Delhi, took me to a, a few temples. We went to a Lakshmi temple and then we went to a Kali temple. And while we were in the Kali temple, I was just in floods of tears because it just felt like I'd come to a sort of a completion of a cycle um, and been through all these really difficult dark nights of the soul and this, this kind Mm. of period awakening. And I walked outside and I only had a few days left in the country and I'd sort of forgotten about the holy man, but I could see what this man looked like. And he had white hair and a white beard and these shining eyes. And my guides had said, you will know him by his shining eyes and the warmth you feel in your heart when you see him. And I was looking for him in the temple because I was like, I'm in the temple. Only, it's the only day I've got to be in the temple. I'm looking around the temple and going, is it him? Is it him? Looking at all these prayers. And half of them were just doing the prayer and like not even caring like it was their day job, right? Take your money, mm. take your offering, chuck it on the altar. Thanks. Off you go. Give you a little blessing, whatever. And we finished our little you know, prayer in the Kali temple. I walked outside. And on the street outside was this man with a begging bowl. And I went, oh, my God, it's him. And I looked at him and I saw the face and then I looked in the eyes and and this man just looked up at me sitting in the gutter and he looked up at me and I just looked at him and I felt the warmth and the light and the shining energy coming from his heart to mine. And I walked up and I gave him some money and my friend Lally gave him some sweets that we'd, we'd taken an offering from the temple and they give it back to you. So we gave him the sweets and I gave him some money. And there were no words spoken, Nick. But in that moment, mm. I swear to God, so much wisdom came from the eyes of that man wow. because it was like a part of my soul just went, wow. Like mm. he's just radiating joy and he it was like even though he had the little bowl there was no like i could feel that he still had joy for his life and i could feel that you know everyone he was just he met me with all this love and this huge smile and this recognition that was his way of blessing everybody that's it i think and in that moment i could almost i could recognize that that inspired leader in him that that holy man yeah well it's interesting you say that because another way i'd like to think of leadership is you know leadership is about being the presence of love in any situation just an example isn't it yeah and it doesn't necessarily mean doing a lot yeah you know my friend um who i mentioned the downton producer you know she told me a little story of you know being parachuted into another project and i'm feeling like she'd done a really bad job and not not bad but it's like she didn't choose the people that she would normally work with and at the rap party at the end of it, you know, she got a card and the card said, thank you for the light you brought. And she was telling herself a story of like, you know, I didn't do as good a job as I could have done. Mm-hmm. Yet everybody on the set was saying to her, you know, without you, this would have turned to crap. Yeah. Uh, so she was the presence of love when everything around her was, you know, very jangled. Uh, and I just love that idea. You know, she's a student of A Course in Miracles. So that's kind of what she does, you know, even though she's... And, and I like this idea that, you know, we have a an earthly job description and a spiritual job description. And I think our earthly job description could be beggar, could be executive producer, could be healer, could be writer. Yeah. Our spiritual job description is to be the presence of love in any, to the best of our ability in every situation. Oh, that, I don't even think we need to say any more after that. That was just pure inspiration right there. Exactly what you just said. That is so beautiful. So, Nick, how can people find you? How can people um, – Have you got what's your website and your details? Uh, so my website is IamNickWilliams.com. Um, so people can contact me at Nick uh, at IamNickWilliams.com. Um, you can get my book there. You can get it on Amazon. Um, but really, I just love, you know, inspiring people, as I hope you can tell. So, you know, please contact me to 
you know, I'm happy to ask, answer questions and, you know, subject to availability, I'm, I'm always happy to just have a chat, you know, because I, I know that sometimes a 10 minute chat with somebody has changed my life. And if I can help somebody alter the course of their life in a 10 minute chat, I'm happy to do it. So by all means, get in touch. And I know at the moment, can people download, they can download a free chapter of your book? Sure. Yeah. If you just go to the homepage of my website, you can download a chapter of the, of the first chapter of the new book for free. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, and I'm on all, you know, I'm not big on social media, but I'm on all the social media platforms as well. But you can find them from the website. So it's iamnickwilliams.com. iamnickwilliams.com. And the, the official date for the book coming out is? April. Uh, well, officially, it's the 28th of April. I'm doing an event with alternatives to, to launch it. Um, Amazing. I've got we'll try and get this up before then so that people can get all the details. And I'll, I'll put all the links to uh, your website and where people can buy the book and everything below. Um, Nick, have you got any final words for our viewers before we go? Um, yeah, well, we, you know, we, I don't want to go into it big time, but we, we talked about it just before we started recording, which was about, you know, that we also, I think, you know, being an inspired leader is also about looking at your own shadow. Mm. You know, it's the willingness to look inside, you know, because I think the old model of leadership is so much about judgment. You know, you're right. Somebody else is wrong. You know, it's about division. And I think, you know, the, for me, the new model of leadership is about unification. Yeah. And I think the only way we can do that is by recognizing and clearing our own judgments on ourselves and everybody else. And the reality is, you know, I think we've all got massive judgments. You know, and I think sometimes when we're thinking, I have to be spiritual, we have to pretend we're not judgmental. The reality is, you know, I've been incredibly judgmental of myself and other people. So it's, it's not that I want to be judgmental, it's, it's kind of recognizing I have been. And in a way, loving, even loving the judgments. It's but so by loving the judgments and accepting the judgments, I get to be less judgmental. It's so true because we learn from it every time, don't we? I was, I, I was talking to someone about this yesterday. I wrote a poem about it, actually. It was like, the shadow never goes away. The darkness doesn't go away. It's not about clearing it. It's always there. And we always yeah. have that, that potential um, to be in light or shadow or to be a good person or to maybe make mistakes. But the more that we are aware of it, the more we kind of learn from it, bless it and integrate it. And mm, then yeah. And, uh, and then we don't have to project it onto other people. Exactly. You know, yeah. I think for me, the best leaders are those that go, I know what that feels like. 100%. Yeah. Mm. You know, so they, they don't necessarily condone people's behavior, but they understand why they behave the way they do. The way they do. Absolutely. That's and it's shaped final thought, too, doesn't so, it, without yeah. challenge? Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book about shadow. And, you know, what is our shadow and how do we integrate it? I always like Jung's idea. I think he said something like the hope for humanity is that we, we take back our shadow from our neighbor. Yes. Yes. We stop scapegoating everybody else and yeah. open things in ourselves. I think it's getting quite fun now to delve into the shadow. I, I, I probably almost go overkill on it. <laughs> what have I got to find here? You know, and I've got, I've seen some really like I've had some really vivid, um, spontaneous past life memories come up of lifetimes you know yeah. where I maybe wasn't so nice and it's almost a relief because it, it takes the pressure off right if we think we have to be perfect all the time yeah good luck with that one <laughs> hard. Like, you know like you can't be like this angelic being especially when you're a healer or a spiritual teacher I think authenticity is the way forward really and that's that's where it is people want to know mm. that you're like them you know that you're a normal person and you know we all have to wipe our own bum. Sorry, that's very Australian of me, but... <laughs> no, it's true. You know, and I think if you put yourself on any kind of pedestal, there's only one direction of travel, you know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you get knocked off it. So, yeah. you know, that's why I love the idea of, you know, great leadership is about looking at our shared humanity. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Nick yeah. Williams, thank you so, so much. For well, thank you for the opportunity. And just for our viewers, again, his website is IamNickWilliams.com. I'll put all the links below so that you can have a look. I'd love to hear your feedback um, on this interview and anything you'd like to, to let Nick, Nick know, any questions you have for him, I can pass them on. And uh, I look forward to seeing and reading your book, Nick. I'm very yeah, well, I'll send you one. And any future events you have coming up. So thank, thank you so much. Thanks and for watching, everyone. Watching. God bless. Go well. Mm -hmm.